Hello everybody and welcome back to Maverick Motors. So in today's video we're doing a bit of a question and answer session. About a fortnight ago I asked everybody on my Instagram, on my YouTube and on Facebook to send us in some questions on what you would like to know and it could be absolutely anything. So we have got a, a couple of weird ones in here. It's not all about cars but it should make for an interesting video. So let's get cracking. Okay so first off we have got a very good friend of mine, Joe Miller from Miller Corner and Classics World TV. Um, yes, Joe does all the videography. Video, video, blah, 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 blah. Did I call him Jack as well? Joe does all the videography at Classics World TV and he runs his own channel, Miller Corner. He does some fantastic content on both of those channels and I really highly recommend that you go and subscribe to them and watch some videos on there. So anyway, cracking on with it. Uh, Joe has asked, money no object, three car garage. Now this took me quite a while to actually uh, think of three cars that if I only ever had three cars, what would I have? Um, so I would definitely have for like top of the range money no object car a Ferrari F355 I'm not usually a big Ferrari fan but ever since I saw uh, Jeremy Clarkson's Unleashed on Cars when I was a child uh, the ending scene with that Ferrari it just I've fallen in love with them ever since um, and it'd have to be either in red or yellow and the hard top uh, it couldn't be the convertible one I just I've got to have one of them obviously me being me uh, Rover 827 SLI, Vitesse, Sterling, one of the top of the range ones, but uh, I just, I've always loved them, and preferably pre-facelift as well. I, don't, I may, maybe wouldn't mind a post-facelift one, but if, if I had money no object, it would have to be a pre-facelift <laughs> and a lot of parts to go with it. <laughs> uh, but that would be a fantastic daily driver car, I'd absolutely love one of them. And then finally, now this is, I've actually sort of stretched it to four here, Joe, um, but I'm going to say Ford Anglia 105E or an MGB GT Fishmouth, which is the uh, same one that I actually reviewed in my MGB GT review video. So it's 1971-72, uh, I think. And uh, yeah, fantastic cars. I think they look so much better with the Fishmouth grill. Uh, I just can't make my mind up between the two something like one of those for a proper proper classic car okay so thank you very much joe moving on joseph lloyd so another joe uh, joseph lloyd is from lloyd vehicle consulting if you haven't watched his channel as well please go and have a look at his channel i'll leave a link in the district in the description below god i'm messing up words today so joseph has asked if you are not limited to one car which others would i own in addition to the mg3 I've added this on actually in sort of a, an addition to Joseph Miller's um, Miller Corner's question, mainly because I can then say I would have both an Anglia and an MGB GT. Uh, but as well as that, I'm going to say I would have uh, a couple of motorcycles. I've always wanted a BMW R1150 GS Adventure. My family are actually a motorcycling family at heart. I did ride bikes a couple of years ago, so. Um, you know, I really, really want to get back to riding bikes again at some point. So I'd love a couple of motorcycles, including a couple of BSA, BSAs and Triumphs. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just really into my bikes. As well as that, car-wise, Rover R8, pre-facelift, Rover 800, um, MGB GT, Ford Anglia, maybe a Ford Zephyr. Don't know. Um, Rover P6 or... Triumph 2000. The list goes on, really. Um, just anything from the 60s. As much as I'm into my 80s cars, I really like my 60s cars as well. So I think I'll bridge that out into two sections. 60s cars, P6, 2000s, P5. Um, hmm. Ford Anglia, MGB GT. And... As soon as nothing else is coming to my head, I think I'm going to leave it there on 60s cars. So big saloons I quite like. 80s cars, Ford Granada Mark II in black. Um, Gear X, really like one of them and I don't know why. Um, yeah, always like the Granadas. Um, Ford Cortina Mark V, 4. I'm not very good with my Fords anymore, I'm afraid. Um, Going into the 90s, I'd love to have another Mark III Fiesta like my first car. I, I really, really miss my first car, so I'd love to have another one of them. 
and um, obviously Rover 800, Rover R8. I think that's it, Joseph. So um, I would probably leave it at that. If I was going to have a modern car, though, alongside it, I would probably have to say a Ford Mondeo. I've, I've, uh, my dad had one uh, when I was a bit younger, and I always really liked it. As well as that, maybe a BMW 318M Sport? I think that's what they're called. 2008, 2009, we had one in white, and I really liked that. Which is a surprise for me, because I hate BMWs, usually. Um, so yes. There you go, Joseph. That's my answer to your question. Moving on. So, Tien and Glavin. I hope I'm saying that right. I said that really poshly, actually. Tien and Glavin. Um, he has asked, the place where you got the Rover 800 from, I heard that the owner of the Maestro wanted £700 for it. Would there be a possibility of you getting that? Yes, I think it was roughly seven to £800. Pounds, um, but Dan did look into possibly getting that as a, our next project but sadly the Maestro is just a bit too far gone um, for that price range so if he does come down we will definitely you know we'll probably leap at that um, but only if the price moves a little I think it was 800 that he wanted for it um, same with the Cavalier the Cavalier was uh, he wants a bit too much for the Cavalier as well and it's it's a case of with a lot of the cars that were there they were up for sale for a lot more than what they're worth. Um, we actually we didn't buy the 800 from we didn't buy the Jetberg Rover 800 from the dealership. We actually bought it from someone who had bought it and picked it up from the dealership. Yes, essentially it's it's very unlikely, but we'd like to. So it's a case of if something changes, then maybe. Um, but yes, so there you go, Tinan. Thanks for your question. Moving on. Um, Eral Ackman asks, do you believe in star signs? When I need to. <laughs> when I want to. Um, part of me wants to say star signs are a load of old bullshit, but um, part of me also wants to say, you know, when when something's good with star signs, then you tend to believe it. And I think that's the same with a lot of things. So, um, yes, sort of. Um, is your answer to that one, but he's also got a second question. He said, favourite modern super mini, if you have one. Favourite modern super mini? Hmm. It's not the Fiesta. And I hate to say it's not the MG3 either. Not the modern one, anyway. Hmm. Modern super mini. That's it. That's it. Yes. Um. Oh, what's it called? VW Up GTI. I would have one of them in an instant. Always wanted one of them since they came out. I absolutely loved them. Uh, I saw them on Grand on the Grand Tour back in season two, and um, yeah, when I saw James May driving it and the sound actuator, I know it's all not real, but as a daily driver, I'd love one of them. I think they're absolutely brilliant looking cars, uh, and it really reinforces the sort of modern but yet retro Mark One Golf GTI in a modern concept, which I think is brilliant. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd have as my favourite modern super mini. So Shane Robinson, hello Shane, I used to work with you. Uh, Shane Robinson asks, which car from the Rover MG lineup would you bring back and modernise a version of? Um, so if we're talking about MG Rover specifically, I would have to say maybe the MGF, or more likely the MGZR, mainly because I owned an MGZR and I think a modernised version of one of them would really suit um, today's sort of electric cars. Um, I'm thinking in, you know, how people are moving towards electric car technology. I think an MGF or an MGZR with a low down, low down lithium ion battery would work really, really well. Uh, mainly the ZR obviously because you could base it on something like the MG, the modern MGZS SUV platform. Um, so yes, but they are doing something similar to that hopefully with the MG3. I do want to say though, if we're talking about the entire history of the two marks, um, MG wise I would have to say probably the MG EXE concept car. It's one car I wish they made and I think it's sort of a modern car with that sort of bubble, glass roof, door, window windscreen concept would look fantastic on a modern car with our angular designs that we're going back to now. Uh, but Rover wise, I would love to see a modern version of an SD1. Big fan of uh, executive cars, me. 
uh, would re I would really really like to see an electric version of one of them when the electric powertrains get a bit better. That David Bake, I think I'm getting it right, it's David Bake um, styling on the front with that kicked up back end and the kicked up rear quarter window would just look fantastic with a modern update because the cars still look fairly modern now um, especially the late 80s ones they do look quite retro but with a little bit of work I think you can make them look very modern so thanks for your question Shane and moving on uh, Kieran Reed of Life on Cars YouTube fame um, what got you into Rovers and MGs and why? Um, so uh, as you guessed probably by my t-shirt I was originally a massive massive Ford fan uh, I've kind of moved away from the Ford scene a lot recently uh, in the past few years but uh, when I first got into cars hence why I had my Fiesta and my car uh, I loved um, Ford and just anything from the 60s through to the 90s but then I had my crash which meant that I needed to get a new car and I'd been looking at getting an MG3 but I just didn't have the money um, and then that got me into looking at the older marks so like Rovers I ended up going out buying my Rover 25 that you've heard about in a previous video and then I ended up replacing that with an MG ZR that I got given and from there it's just escalated so I've ended up having Metro's 200's and my MG3 and just really getting into the British car community and I'm really thankful for my crash for that one very reason because if not I'd probably still be driving Fords and I much prefer British cars. Not to say that Fords are inherently bad, I just I get on better with British cars. So yeah, there you go Kieran, thanks for your question and moving on. Next question comes from Lewis Mackland and this is a very odd question. How do you get your teeth so perfect? Well, Lewis, as a British citizen, I think you should know that the words perfect and teeth don't go with one another. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I don't think I really have perfect teeth. I've got this really odd one here that just... Yeah, I'm not going to go into teeth. It's a bit odd. But, yeah, I don't know. I just brush them. <laughs> but, yes, thanks for your question, Lewis. And uh, moving on to a chap called Matty, who has asked... Hi mate, for your Q&A, I saw your video with your MG3. Thank you very much for watching that, Matty. Um, I have a 2014 MG3, same as yours I believe. I was looking to put a new performance air filter and maybe a new exhaust on it. Um, I've been looking all over the internet and I can't find anywhere that does a performance air filter for the MG3 that has got some good reviews. Which one do you use and where do you get it from? Also, I would love to see more mods uh, on the MG3 and more videos of them. I would do the spark plugs, but I have no idea of what's going on with cars, so I don't want to ruin my engine. Uh, well, thank you very much for your question, Matty. Um, with regards to modifying your MG, the best place I can advise you to go to is A, join the MG Car Club and join the MG635 register, because there's a lot of people and a lot of people who run companies on the 635 register that specifically do modern MGs uh, so you can get a lot of options from that and as well as that you've got the technical advice help of the MG635 register. For your air filter the one I currently use is a ITG performance air filter. Uh, I will leave that in the link if they uh, in the link in the description if they still do it. I hope they do because I only bought it about a year and a half ago and it's just a panel air filter so you shouldn't have to change anything on your insurance because it's just a service part. Um, it is lifelong though so obviously you clean it and it's it's been very good for my engine, it's fantastic. Um, you could get a universal cone filter although I advise heavily against it unless if you do a lot of rerouting to, um, to get the uh, air filter away from the hot air for the engine. The only other option, if I remember rightly, is uh, MG and AMC parts do a performance air filter, but it's not a lifelong one. It's a it's similar to the standard air filter, but with the blocked off part opened up. Uh, exhaust wise, I advise you go to either MG, AM, uh, MG and AMC parts, Browns and Gammons, or go to Powerflow. Powerflow did my exhaust for me and they did a fantastic job. They can essentially cut from wherever you want. So let's say if you want a straight pipe, which I advise against because it's illegal, um, they can cut from a 
you know manifold area or wherever or, or if you want from a cat back they can cut from a cat put a new bracket in and then make it stainless from the cat back which is what I did and they can also specify on how loud or quiet you want it which is really really what I was wanting I was wanting something a bit quieter than what other exhaust manufacturers produced so that's why I went with power flow was I overseed uh, I was overseeing what was going to be put on my car which was a bit more interesting for me leave a link to Powerflow's website in the description and all the other websites that I've mentioned. Um, Powerflow do have a dealers all across the country and they've got a little map thing on their website where you can have a look and see where your local dealer is. Right, so thank you very much Matty for that question. I hope that really helped. If you need anything else, just drop me a message on Instagram or Facebook or pop a comment down below and I shall get back to you. Okay, so moving on to YouTube comments, because those were all from Instagram. Um, Claire Nixon. Hello, Claire. Um, Claire asks, is, your is Nick your uncle and is Dan your dad? Uh, I know this has been asked before, but it was never confirmed. Love the channel, by the way. Well, Claire, being Dan's wife, you should know. <laughs> but honestly, I wouldn't put it past them. You're not my dad! <laughs> Uh, bloody hope Dan isn't my dad, though. <laughs> that would be an awkward episode of Who Do You Think You Are? <laughs> but, uh, yes, thanks for your question, Claire, and I shall see you when lockdown ends. <laughs> DL Warren, he asks, When lightning strikes the sea, what happens to the fish? Well, I'm not very scientifically minded, but, Mr Warren, I will say that due to thing, I would have thought that it wouldn't go down into the sea because A there's too much mass of the sea if anything as well as that it'll dissipate the electrical uh, sig not signals, uh, the electrical current so it just wouldn't allow it to go across so I'm the fish would be fine I would say um, what happens to the current now I don't know, I, I'm, I'm gonna say the fish will be fine I don't really know whether the current would go down into the sea or whether it would go across the top of the sea. Um, so let's say if you were swimming, I think you'd be shocked or something. I don't know, it depends. Could be de depending on whether the strike was 1.21 gigawatts or gigawatts or whatever. And yeah. Actually, do you know what? Google time. When lightning strikes. What happens to the fish? Right, when lightning strikes the sea. So, when lightning hits the water, the current zips across the surface in all directions, and if you're swimming anywhere in the vicinity, it will probably hit you. Uh, below the surface, most of the electricity is instantly neutralised, so the fish are generally spared. So, yeah. I, I was close. Yeah. So, there you go. Um. That's what happens when lightning strikes the sea. What happens to the fish? Thanks very much, DL Warren. Okay, moving along to drive alternative. Uh, what 2000 era car do you think will be classics in years to come? I reckon the R353 Mini Cooper S, Mazda RX-8 and Citroen C6. Um, well, first of all, I will say I'm of the mindset of any car after a certain while will become a classic not necessarily saying that let's say a year 2000 Focus will become a classic and then a year 2000 Mini Cooper will become a classic at the same time I think some do take longer than others depending on the design but I think everything will become a classic in some terms of the word after a while I would say I think you've chosen well there with the R53 Mini Cooper S, especially the Y Reg ones, the early ones that were um, Rover designed. There was a lot of um, original Rover Group input in that uh, R53 original design, um, and as well as that, they're thin on the ground at the Y Reg. Um, if you are interested in a Y Reg, reg no, 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 no. if you are interested in a, in a Y Reg Mini. <laughs> 
Um, please do head to the Mini Y register and they can help you all out if you are interested in seeing if you can find one. Uh, Master RX-8. I do think that these are a bit of a niche car because of the fact that they've got a uh, rankled rotary engine and that they've got the suicide doors and they're quite a different looking car. I think these are one of the ones that are going to become classics quicker than others. Um, so I think you've chosen well with those two and the Citroen C6, it's, I mean it's a big luxury car that they didn't make very many of them. What I think would come into classic categories would be, I mean you've got your niche ones like your Citroen C6, your Renault Aventines, MPVs I don't think are going to become classics very quickly, much as the way of SUVs of the early 90s and late 80s haven't really become classics other than maybe the odd Land Cruiser and Land Rover Defenders. Saloon car wise I would say definitely the Citroen C6. Rover 75 is a definite because it's it's getting rare on the ground now the company's non-existent anymore so that uh, provides some sort of appeal to people. Rover 800s especially the later ones now that they're becoming thin on the ground the earlier ones are already classics so you know, um, not really going to go on to that. Ford Focus Mark 1s, especially the really early ones, I would definitely say they're going to become classics. I find it so hard to find a Mark 1 Focus around nowadays, and uh, they, they were very advanced cars for the time. Um, they really brought Ford into the 21st century, so the uh, Mark 1 Focus was just, it was such a leap ahead of what Ford could do. So, yeah, one of those would be definitely something to go for, and... God, let's pick one more. Something that's not a Ford. Smart Roadster. Yeah, Smart Roadster would definitely be, the, be in there. Smart Roadster, MGTF. Um, those two, especially the, just that Smart Roadster, there isn't very many of, that, m many of them left either. And they're not that enjoyable to drive, I hear. Um, I might be wrong. But uh, they are... I think they're quirky looking cars. I, I think they'll definitely be worth a fair bit of money in a while. You've got to think, classics, they are always end up being everyday cars um, that are, you know, the more poverty spec you get, usually after a while they tend to be more expensive or that sort of, not necessarily poverty spec, but the more everyday car they can get. So like with, uh, you look at Escort Populars, they're getting quite ex expensive now, and uh, Marinas and Miners, they're getting really expensive. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely say Focus, MGTF, and Smart Roadster is my three. Oh, and Rover 75 as well. And Okay, so thank you very much, Drive Alternative. And moving on to Dean Bailey. Loving the channel. Thank you very much. I'm thinking of getting a project car, but I can't decide between a Rover 800 Fastback, Rover 75, or a Cavalier. Thoughts? Well, they're all three very good options. Um, the Rover 800 Fastback depends on whether you're um, using it as a, more of a daily driver or whether you are wanting a classic car in the traditional sense, like getting something 70s, 80s. If you want something that's already a bona fide retro looking classic car, get a Mark 1 Rover 800 Fastback. They have got all the 80s bells and whistles, you know, like ribbed rear lights, um, the interiors all very old, you know, you've got a steering wheel that looks like it's straight out of Miami Vice or something. Um, but if you want something that's a bit more usable, the parts are a bit more easy to get hold of, but as well as that, it's a bit more modern and you can pick them up cheaper than the Mark 1s, definitely go for a Mark 2, which they made between 1991 and 1998, although you will find some late registered right up until about 2000 registered Rover 800s. You get two different fields with the 800 Fastback. I find with the earlier ones you feel like you're in almost like a Granada beater. You know, it's something that's a bit classier than a Granada, but it's in that sort of league of boxy executive car. Whereas in the Mark II R17, it's more of a miniature Jag. It's it's a car that definitely feels like you're maybe part of the establishment. You know, I love the 80s look of the Mark I, and I love the luxury look of the Mark II. Uh, which then brings us onto the Rover 75. Rover 75, you will find there's plus points for both the 800 and the 75 in terms of reliability. Um, I would say maybe steer clear of the 
KV6 if you're new to project cars. There's three cam belts and it can be quite expensive to fix if it goes wrong. Uh, but then, then again, the diesels also have them pro have their problems even as a BMW diesel. And the um, the 1.8K K series is obviously very well renowned for holding its water. Uh, it it isn't. It's uh, it's it's so renowned for having the head gasket go. Uh, but all I will say is the K series is a good engine underneath if you look after them. Uh, people slam them a lot for you know they they really slate the K series for being a bad engine and I, it really isn't. It's very good engine. You just need to look after them. As well as that, I will say the Robo 75 in comparison to an 800 feels quite claustrophobic. Uh, Cavalier, they already have started raising in value, but you don't see many of them about. I very, very rarely see one at shows, even in comparison to Rover 800s. Um, I don't know whether that's because I just typically spend more time at uh, Rover 800, uh, Rover BL related shows, but um, yeah, you don't really see Cavaliers about. My uncle used to have one when I was younger. And I do actually have quite fond memories of Cavaliers, even though I don't usually like modern Vauxhalls. But Cavaliers I quite like, especially Mark III ones. Um, but I think because of the following that Vauxhalls got, just like Ford, um, you'll find it hard pressed now to get something for maybe, I would say, less than £1,500 for a decent Cavalier. Um, and that's a decent Cavalier that maybe needed some work. You can maybe pick one up for less than a grand, but 80s and 90s cars, they are just raising in price so much. So I would say, value-wise, out of the two of them, late 800 Fastback or a Rover 75. Uh, the 800's got the ball practicality and the bigger space. Cavalier, though, if you're wanting the 80s look, you could go for a later Cavalier, which will give you the 80s feel of the Mark I 800, um, but uh, probably at a cheaper price point and uh, more availability. So I would say out of all of those, either Mark 1 800 as a proper project if you've got a separate car, or a Cavalier Mark 3, um, but probably your best bet for the niceties in between the two is definitely Rover 800 Mark 2, because you get the best of both worlds. You get the 80s interior, you get the um, value because you can still pick them up fairly decently priced and you get the comfort the space and plus the parts are still fairly available for them so yeah i would say rover 800 fastback mark ii or r17 or cavalier is a close second sorry for that very elongated answer but thank you very much dean bailey and moving on to austin allegra uh, austin allegra agatha hello and welcome back uh, nice to see you in the comments again um are we planning to bring the Jetberg Rover back to its dealership in Church Gresley uh, to go full circle and show it driving past its prison cell it was caged in for years? Uh, this would make a good video and I would love to be back there in person to see it. Ah uh, yes, because you live very locally, I do remember. Uh, yes, we are hoping once it goes through an MOT and once lockdown is li lifted enough for us to be able to actually visit the area, we are hoping to um, bring the 800 back to the area. It is a case of we've got to get it through an MOT first, we're maybe thinking of seeing if we can get it on the forecourt, we're maybe thinking of seeing if we can have like a convoy of several 800s, we're maybe thinking of seeing if we can get in touch with other owners of the other cars that were taken away from uh, Jetberg Limited. The main plan is we are really trying to actually take the Jetberg 800 back before we do anything else with it. The first thing is we need to take it back to um, Castle Gresley because it was the one thing that we'd, we would just make us very proud. It was very proud today, you know, actually being able to see the car yesterday actually move on and be moving now that it's had all its brakes done and it sounds fantastic. It's a very, very clean car now, barring the slight paint imperfections um, but we would really like to take it back to find a car easy lease and uh, do some fo photos with it and a video but uh, yes in answer to your question yes we are planning on bringing it back to its 
original resting place at Church Gresley, Castle Gresley, Jetberg Limited, find the car easily, so that was a long mouthful. But uh, yes, so that brings us to the end of the questions, I think. Um, so yes, thank you very much for watching everybody. If you did enjoy this video and you want, maybe want me to do another one at some point soon or uh, in the future, then please leave a like and leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. As well as that, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for future video updates. And uh, I shall see you in the next video. Thanks very much for watching.